Hello, everyone. Hello, V, uh, Hung, and Bert. Um, so welcome to uh, the final, the closing session for the day, the second day of Asia PEBC Summit 2020. Um, so yeah, so it's really exciting two days and um, I'm really excited um, about this closing session um, because it's about Vietnam and I am the Vietnam-based correspondent for Digital Asia. Um, so joining us today, we have uh, Vi Le and Hang Do. Um, Vi are the two iconic uh, women in the Vietnam tech ecosystem. Um, Vi is the general partner at Do Ventures, um, the newest uh, venture capital firm in Vietnam uh, with a big mission on the country. And um, Hang is the um, CEO of S Commerce. Um, so you may all know that um, Singapore-based uh, in uh, government investor Temasek uh, invested a significant, significant round in the company last year. And uh, we also have Bert Kwan um, from uh, BDA Partners Capital. So Bert uh, needs no introduction. Um, he has been uh, very active uh, in the, the tech investment space across Southeast Asia and Vietnam too. So today we're talking about um, technology in Vietnam and uh, you all know that uh, the tech ecosystem in Vietnam started to uh, get attention of, from international um, investors and stakeholders uh, maybe since um, 2015. And throughout the past five years, we have seen a lot of developments, a lot of interest, a lot of funding into the ecosystem. Um, and uh, now with COVID-19, there is a certain challenge uh, in terms of uh, uh, deal activities and also, you know, um, the devel development for, for the entrepreneurs. And so today we will be all discussing all that. Um, but I think we will first start the conversation with uh, some personal stories. Um, so our two ladies, um, V, so you started out as a um, e-commerce founder and then you uh, moved into investing um, in uh, Hang. Uh, quite a, you know, like a, 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 a kind of a bit different story. So you were in, uh, you were, you was with uh, some investment firms in the past, and then you, um, you're now with S Commerce to, to head the um, operations of the companies. Uh, so you two, please take us through um, that journey and, uh, you know, the ships in, in your career and um, when did you, you know, when did you, you realize that um, engaged in uh, like deeply in the technology space um, is meant for your career? Um, who can go first? I think you can go Maybe. first. Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, thanks, Digital Asia, for inviting me to join this wonderful event. Uh, I'm honored to be here. So I started my tech career quite early. So I started my first company when I was about 13 years old at the time. I provided the web development services. And later on, I um, tried to provide a more digital service like web hosting service. And at the time I was very young, I didn't really understand business. So my biggest challenge back then was how to really, you know, carry on the business. So I don't know anything about marketing. I don't know anything about, you know, signing contract with customers. And then I went to the US to study. And at the time I um, had a chance to become an eBay power seller. So I understood the magic of e-commerce back in the 2004 period. So right after my college graduation, I was very fortunate because I had the chance to return to Vietnam and uh, I started my first official tech company. Uh, and we focus on uh, uh, the fashion and beauty uh, 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 sector. And at the time, my model was so similar to Timor. So we're building a B2B2C platform to support all these uh, distributors and manufacturers in the fashion and beauty business. I didn't know back then. So my, my journey started quite early and you know, I had a lot of experience uh, as a founder. And in 2017, after you know, exiting my company and then worked for one of the largest conglomerates in Vietnam, I realized that there's a lot of gaps in the technical system in Vietnam, especially there's a lot of gaps in funding. Uh, so that's why I decided to make a transition to become a venture capitalist. And I think, you know, throughout my career, right, uh, the only thing that I want to do is to deliver values to the consumer uh, to a number of ways. And I still believe that the technical system in Vietnam is still very young, very early. 
but there's a lot of potential to grow uh, some of the uh, iconic uh, companies from this time forward. And how about you, Han? Thanks, Snob, uh, for inviting us to this event. Next time I propose that Ministry of Asia has an event in Vietnam, so we can all meet in person because Vietnam handles COVID so well. Uh, for me, the story is actually very short. I came back from the US about 10 years ago, and since then I have always been in an operational role. Uh, I guess in, in Vietnam, I just want to do where whatever that I can see that I can add values on a daily basis and make change. Uh, and I obviously never planned my career path to go into logistics, a very unsexy industries uh, like I do today. But it is where I see that you know my expertise and my experience help the team, and it's actually a very young team that uh, employs thousands and thousands of people. And I, I, I guess, you know, technology creates that equal playing field and, and a huge opportunities for countries like Vietnam to leapfrog and the opportunity for myself to create jobs of tens of thousands of delivery staff here and empowering hundreds of thousands of SME merchants. That is quite profound for me personally. Um, and I'm very thankful that technology helps open that door for me to grow in Vietnam for the past 10 years. Thank you. Uh, and for Bert, so you were with Nostar, um, so you have uh, invested uh, a lot across uh, Southeast Asia and uh, during the time with Nostar, you also engaged in the deals in Vietnam. Um, so now you are with the BDA Partners Capital and uh, we wrote about your firm earlier um, that uh, the, the fund will have a significant uh, focus on the Vietnam market. So um, I'm curious why Vietnam? Why a significant allocation for Vietnam? And um, uh, so is, is, um, can you also disclose or tell us the, uh, the fund size or the percentage of uh, allocation for the Vietnam market? Mm. Sure. So, you know, we, and again, th thank you, Nock, for, uh, uh, for inviting me to, the, uh, to join this panel. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's always a pleasure to be uh, to be here with such uh, experienced people like uh, like me and uh, and Hank. Um, yeah, we are indeed very focused on Vietnam, and you know, BDA Capital Partners. We're really in the business of backing entrepreneurs uh, who need capital to grow their businesses. Uh, it's actually quite simple. And when we look across uh, the ASEAN markets uh, right now, uh, and our investment team has experience investing across a number of different cycles in a number of different uh, countries over the past 20 years. Uh, what we see in Vietnam is really a confluence of entrepreneurs who really need capital and don't have capital from other traditional sources, whether it's banks or larger private equity firms that have a regional or a global mandate. Uh, to uh, to grow the businesses, and we we feel it's been that way probably since 2013. Uh, so as a result, starting then when I was actually with Standard Chartered Private Equity, looking after the Southeast Asia investment practice, that was really when we saw the scales tip. Uh, we saw Vietnam tip from a country where there was arguably too much capital for certain types of uh, issuers, certain types of companies, uh, almost overnight to a situation where there wasn't enough capital for entrepreneurs that um, really had high quality uses uh, for, for the fundraise. So as, uh, as Ms. V had stated, um, you know, the, the opportunity right now for us uh, is, is quite compelling uh, because of that scarcity of capital relative to the opportunity. In terms, of our, in terms of our mandate, uh, we have a flexible mandate. We're looking at uh, investment checks uh, up to $20 million. Um, we're working with a, a network of investors. So in some sense, you know, the, the mandate that we have is uh, incredibly flexible. We're, we're looking at opportunities right now as small as $2 million uh, and, uh, and up to that $20 million limit in a wide variety of entrepreneur-backed businesses. Um, so, uh, is, is, is it also flexible in terms of uh, the allocation for the Vietnam market? Uh, it, it is. Uh, we do take a relative value approach across the region. But what I can say uh, is that we're spending most of our time uh, right now in Vietnam because we feel that, that the risk-adjusted opportunity set 
uh, is more attractive in Vietnam on a relative basis than, than some of the other countries. And it really goes back to that scarcity of capital relative to uh, the cohort of entrepreneurs who are looking for that capital. So when the fund um, mainly look into technology or you are um, sector and uh, an agnostic and also look at uh, other uh, type of assets? We, what I would say is that we are sector agnostic, uh, but our starting point when we, when we look at a potential investment opportunity is with the entrepreneur. Uh, and we found a disproportionate number of entrepreneurs uh, in technology or technology enabled sectors. And th there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, but uh, the, you know, the, the pipeline as it were is skewed toward technology enabled businesses. We think because of the relative quality of the entrepreneurs that are looking to build businesses in, the, in, that, in those sectors. So you said that um, you look at deal sizes uh, from 2 million to up to 20 million. Um, so for the uh, upper end uh, of the range, then the, um, will you be um, like solely investing in the companies or um, that uh, you, you also can participate in it with other investors? We, um... What I would say is that uh, we, we're happy to work with other investors uh, for, for an investment, for an aggregate investment that may be larger than $20 million, uh, but we do lead investments. So we do need to uh, have the direct relationship with the entrepreneur. Uh, we do need to underwrite the investment ourselves. We do need to have those rights that uh, our LPs and our co-investors would expect uh, from us. Uh, but because, you know, we are, you know, we don't have any legacy uh, mandate constraints, uh, we can be quite flexible with how we uh, approach an opportunity. Yes. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm allowing myself to take the first, uh, like, taking point from uh, all the three panelists today that um, the, the scene looks really promising for Vietnam. Um, but we also have to look at the data. So our, our data team just this morning um, gave the numbers of uh, uh, that indicating um, the Vietnam win is the healthiest fall in terms of uh, funding um, in the uh, third uh, in um, the last quarters of 2020 um, among Southeast Asia countries. Um, so concurrently with the travel restriction um, that made uh, international investor, you know, just impossible to to come here to do deals, then um, does that um, indicate um, that the Vietnam tech ecosystem is too relying on overseas capital? Um, so this is a question for V. That's why we're here. <laughs> so I think, I think right now, to be honest, right? I talked to many of my friends who are uh, working uh, from foreign funds overseas um, because Vietnam, I think on the foreign micro side, right? Vietnam is uh, growing. Uh, and uh, we have positive GDP, although you know other countries still struggling. So we recover quite fast. Uh, so I think Vietnam is also on top of the list for many investors. And right now, many investors actually try to do deals online. But to be honest, right, they cannot do big check side online without meeting the foreign team. But uh, many investors that I know from overseas, they try to you know keep the deal flow going by you know committing into smaller check side and work with the local investor like New Ventures. So in, in many cases, right, we want to lead the deal and we also invite some of our friends from, from overseas to join us because we are here at, at, in Vietnam, right? We can actually do uh, DD for the co-investor and we can actually meet the team. So I think, I think you know, looking forward, right, Vietnam move up from, I think, fifth out of sixth nation in, in terms of capital injected just uh, in 2017. Now we move to uh, number three or in 2019, we actually move up to number two just behind Indonesia. So I think that's a very good progress. And moving forward, uh, I think uh, the, the role of a local VC like us is very important because we can also uh, play uh, you know, the role of the local supporters and to enable more foreign funds to come in Vietnam and uh, you know, place, uh, help them to have more confidence in the market. Yes. Um, so in the, in the later stage, um, so this is a question to Hung. Uh, when you when you um, you know came out to to talk to investors to raise funds um, and um, maybe from your uh, observation 
uh, of the other major peers, major fellows that um, that also try or have been raising um, bigger funding deals. Um, then the did you have to always, uh, you know, come to or uh, approach a foreign investor for those later stage deals? We did, and we actually uh, prioritized the uh, foreign, uh, especially the foreign institutional investors, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think at later stage, fast growing tech companies, not many funds on, uh, or investors in Vietnam have experienced that and have expertise that can help out the company. Uh, second, we do want investors that can add value in terms of, you know, network, industry know-how, helping the company to the next stage of funding or IPO. Uh, third, I think we do look for more sophisticated investors uh, who have knowledge in, say, the US or China, because companies like ourselves, right, GHN, Nahamuk, we do integrated logistics, and we've never seen that kind of skills before in Vietnam. Uh, in Asia, India, some, but nothing really as big of a scale as say, in China. So we do look for, you know, investor with that, you know, sophistication in mind. And obviously, our bet is that the big, uh, the, the big investors who can write big check size, they can actually look across the market and have longer term vision than just, you know, a one year, three year bet. Because for me, Vietnam is a long term bet. Everyone's going to make money. No one's going to lose money. But it's just a matter of how much money you make and how much of that long-term commitment are you placing in this market? But yes, for us, exclusively for the uh, institutional investors. Um, so Bert, uh, from the investor point of view, um, so, so you do invest in, in the later stage, maybe a series B onwards um, for, for tech companies here. Um, so at this stage, uh, is it hard for you um, to source deals and, uh, you know, and, and how you can make sure that the traction that the companies um, represent um, are, are, are investable and sustainable? Right, I mean, I think that's a, that, that's a very good question. I, I would say that it, 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 it could always be easier for us to originate transactions. Uh, you know, I think that once, once an investor gets to the point where they think origination is, is, is easy, it probably means that um, you know, we're, we're not trying hard enough. Uh, but what I would say is that uh, it helps that that uh, that we've been a repeated dealer in the market in a number of respects. Uh, so for me personally, uh, you know, I've backed seven different entrepreneurs uh, in Vietnam. Most of those entrepreneurs are actually serving on the BDA Capital Partners Advisory Board, uh, and they are a very helpful source of both. Uh, referencing for entrepreneurs as well as uh, origination and probably most importantly it provides entrepreneurs with contact points in their respective markets who can talk um, very honestly and credibly about how we are how I am as a partner on the board as a thought partner um, how we conduct ourselves when things go well and probably more importantly how we conduct ourselves when things don't go well and you know we've had some successes in Vietnam, and we've had some um, some challenges as well. And I think that when we speak with entrepreneurs in country, uh, that that's something that does um, resonate. Um, and what what I would touch on is, is 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 something that Hong had mentioned, which is you know we do have experience investing uh, in the U.S. Say both pre dot com bubble and post dot com bubble. We invested in China in the tech sector uh, in the 2005, 2006 timeframe, as well as in the 2011 timeframe when things were, were much uh, less frothy. And I think that what we found is that a lot of entrepreneurs in Vietnam, because they're so, uh, they have such dynamic growth plans uh, and such ambition, that the type of experience and context that we bring to companies in an earlier stage um, for companies that are looking to raise a smaller check size is not necessarily the type of context they may have for investors that uh, they often come across in the equity check size where we're, where we're playing. Um, so I, I would just, you know, I would just say that that, that type of uh, perspective and experience, I think, has made the origination for us right now uh, a little bit easier. 
Um, but that being said, um, we, we all have blind spots and, you know, do we wish we could see you know, all the opportunities that uh, our, uh, our, our competitors see, of, uh, of course. But having been a repeated dealer in Vietnam, I think certainly helps. I would also mention that BDA Partners, who's the M&A advisory firm with which BDA Capital Partners is, is obviously affiliated, uh, has been in Vietnam since uh, has been in Vietnam since 1996, uh, and probably uh, close to 10 percent or 15 percent of the staff uh, of BDA Partners as an organization is 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 based in Vietnam. So that that certainly is helpful as well. Mm, yes, uh, back to Hung. So we are. Um, talking about the sectors for a, a bit. Um, so you're in logistics now, um, and why um, some, uh, some, some, some fundamentals uh, in the economy um, represent a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of room for growth for the sectors. Um, but there, there's also, uh, I think, quite stiff competition in the market right now. So there's a lot of uh, last buy, also warehousing and deliveries guys are operating in the markets. Um, so what is your view on, on the market status, uh, I mean, the logistic status right now? And um, so let's say if the, if the potential for the market is a um, 10 pieces pie, then the, how much uh, has been taken? That's a very tough question to answer. But I guess uh, we are, one, we are quite lucky to be in logistics because I think along with like health tech, fintech, you know, sectors that can uh, impact millions of uh, consumers or users, logistics is, is one of them. And that's how we have managed to grow just with the wave of e-commerce in Vietnam with all our big customers. Uh, second, yes, the market has become a lot more competitive and that's a good sign. That means that, you know, we are betting on the right sector, the potential is there, macro is good. Uh, logistics will continue to be invested and we need to be a lot more efficient because the cost of logistics is currently too high and with the help of logistics you know a lot of other sectors will continue to grow. Uh, third I think back to competition uh, we know that you know there are a lot of regional players with much uh, more money very deep pocketed investments coming to Vietnam and super aggressive but I think that's just the nature of good markets these competitors really push us forward and make us innovate faster, change ourselves faster, and just really need to add value to the customers, right? At the end of the day, I don't think uh, competition uh, will say, like, who's the winner? The customers will eventually decide who's the winner, whoever can add the most value to, uh, to their business, right? Uh, so for us, you know, keeping our heads down, super focused on operations, uh, deliver the package much faster at a much lower cost, uh, positive unit cost, et cetera. All of this very fundamental business problem needs to be done before we can expand visionally or expand to other sectors. And, and for, for, I think we are pretty lucky again that we have been quite capital conservative and quite efficient from the very beginning. So we just keep our heads out and just you know, keep on working. Hmm. Can, can you elaborate on the part of uh, being cap uh, capital conservative? Um, I guess just like, you know, uh, what Bert and, and B said in the beginning, uh, the companies, startup companies, the tech companies in Vietnam just have access to regional capital very recently. Before that, you know, most of the companies in the market are kind of bootstrapping, you know, raise smaller rounds and just have to make it work, have to scale before any foreign investors come in. And of course, you know, investors are scared of Vietnam and they'd rather put money in Indonesia because it's much, it seems much safer there. So we have, a, I think we have a pretty long period where company for the first, I guess, five years of this past decade, where companies just have to grow by itself. And then for the past five years, you start, you know, raising bigger rounds and making headlines and bringing regional investors uh, to the market. Uh, so, you know, we never had, for us, for example, logistics, we actually never had a lot of money to play with until, you know, thematic came in last year. And we are very, very thankful for their participation in the company. Got it. Um, so in terms of, in terms of the sectors, uh, the new frontiers, uh, according to the recent Google, Thomas and Bean report, uh, education, edutech and health tech uh, were picked as the next, uh, next frontiers. Um, and also Do Ventures has a report that also highlighted um, these two sectors. Uh, so we, um, uh, like, um, what, 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 
are the opportunities and also challenges in these two sectors? Because you know, we haven't seen a lot of like really disruptive models out of those two. Um, so is, is it just because of the demand side or the supply side? And yeah, so what are the opportunities and also challenges for them? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge for tech companies to enter these two sectors um, is uh, you know, they, they need to be able to work with very traditional institutions. For example, in education, right? You need to be able to provide solutions to public schools, which is impossible before COVID. Because I think uh, you know, a lot of schools, they uh, are used to the way things run with a lot of papers and Excel and some management system, right? But uh, there's no need to really have online classes before. So definitely, I think over the past few years, we've seen a number of uh, you know tech companies trying to enter this sector, but we haven't seen um, uh, that many disruption yet because I think you know people are still used to things offline a lot. Uh, now, the reason why you know Google and Temasek report, or you know from our report, when we do surveys of some of the most active uh, uh, VC funds in in the region, they all bet on. Uh, you know, edu education and uh, healthcare. We think it's because of the changing in uh, mindset of traditional institutions in those sectors. So to give to give you an example, right, in healthcare, uh, just in May after the first lockdown in Vietnam, uh, the Ministry of Health actually organized conference and they actually asked all the tech startups in healthcare or the med tech company to come and directly, uh, you know, have like uh, direct dialogue with the uh, on the head of uh, public hospital just to share what they can offer. And uh, there's open dialogues from, from that time to now. And I think, I definitely think that this is just a starting point. And um, next year we would uh, see more uh, startups that can enter some of these like, traditional institutions and provide a solution. And we would see more disruption in the market. So the biggest challenge is to changing the mindset, right? So these sector haven't been uh, invested uh, uh, heavily over the past few years. And the, the amount of money that went into uh, health tech is so minimal. We don't even see them on, on the headlines. But I think from now on, if uh, you know some of these use cases actually turn out to be viable, then investors would have more confidence and they would invest more in the, the healthcare and the education sector. And then we'll see more companies uh, you know, leveraging the capital efficiently and be able to acquire more users. Yes. Uh... But speaking of the, the pandemic and the, the, the lockdown, um, but uh, we are lucky enough that the lockdown lasted for maybe only three months, right? Three months, uh, quite a short time compared to other markets in the region. So do you think that this is not a long enough time to really shift the consumer behavior and you know really see um, like a surge in terms of um, digital adoption? I think, I think it's been an impact, right? So before all the public school, they don't need to really have online tool to conduct class online. Now all the schools, they have to prepare because we never know if there's another lockdown or not. So mm -hmm. right now I have, um, you know, I have a uh, fortunate to meet a number of uh, companies in education. They provide the SaaS solution to have school digitalized. And so far they shared with me that they have very impressive number of, uh, you know, adopting the usage from, from very famous and public school. So I think it's, it's changing, right? Although we don't have, uh, you know, tremendous lockdown like on any other country, but um, I think all the business realize that now they need to have tools to um, you know, work remotely. Now they need tools to manage the work more efficiently and they need solution to uh, you know, provide a service online you know, without relying too much on the you know, offline contact. So I think although we're fortunate, but uh, you know, I think all the business needs to be here. Yes, uh, over to Bert. Um... So you, do you have any thoughts on, on those um, new sectors and also on the, generally on disruptives and new models? Um, so maybe uh, as a later stage investor, you are more concerned about um, profitability, uh, the possibility to be, you know, able to, to, to generate profits. Um, so mm -hmm. after the, the, the fiascos of uh, WeWork, Uber, those stories, did you think the, the skepticism is still there in the Vietnam market? Is somehow affected by those stories. I, I think um, you know it's, it's a very interesting question, uh, and you know I, I don't want to cast aspersions on on, on any particular business model, um, but you know I recall 
um, making some of my early investments in the mid to late 90s in, uh, in dot com type companies. And it was the same type of language that you that you're hearing now with some companies, which is we're going to spend a lot of money, we're going to be selling products uh, or services at negative gross margins, and we're going to build a network effect that at some point in time uh, is going to uh, become you know, a net present value positive proposition. Uh, and I think that history has just shown that, that is, um, it, it's possible to make money that way but it's not necessarily the easiest business plan to execute. So whether some of those models that you mentioned, uh, whether that skepticism you know, has impacted Vietnam uh, and the investor, uh, the investor enthusiasm for those um, models, I, I, can't, I can't speak to how other investors would feel. I think from our perspective, you know, we've always started with the entrepreneur and the business model. And the starting point is, is each incremental dollar that we invest, where does it go? Does it make sense? What's the return on cap? What's the return of capital on, you know, on that incremental dollar? And it's not to say that we're always focused on profitability as a later stage investor. In fact, many of the companies uh, that we've backed before and, and we're looking at right now are not profitable. But what we do look at is we look, we look to see if the business plans uh, are fully funded or are close to be fully funded with our capital. Uh, and again, whether or not there's visibility on whether or not the, uh, the return on capital for our, our dollars invested is, is really there. Um, in terms of the disruptive technologies, and uh, uh, I mean, let me just react a bit to what he has said as well around edutech and health tech, because those, of course, are, are very interesting sectors that at a very high level, I think for a lot of investors, um, we've 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 experienced an edge tech across a number of different markets, and we've looked at uh, health tech as well. And I think what we found is that, you know, with half the world right now having had some experience with online education as a result of COVID, I think we all know it's hard to do. It's really difficult to teach anything online. And if you're fumbling with Google Classroom or Google Meets and you know, you're trying to manage your children's education, it, it's not perfect. And this is Google. Um, and I think that when we, when we see the number of entrepreneurs who are trying to slap an edutech label on their company, uh, but it's not necessarily executed well and the consumer experience is not necessarily there, I think we found that that's, um, that, that's a recipe for, for trouble. Uh, and with health tech, I think it's a little bit similar. I think what we've, what we've found uh, on a more encouraging note is that we've seen a lot of, I should say a lot, a number of health, uh, of health sector entrepreneurs who are using technology to really provide that core healthcare experience, uh, the health services, uh, in, a, in, a much, in a much improved way from the, from the patient's perspective. So I think the, you know, the challenges that the Vietnam healthcare system generally faces is, is well known. Uh, and there are a number of entrepreneurs right now that we're seeing just deliver that basic traditional healthcare product uh, in a way that is much better than what's available in the market. And technology is just a tool. So mm -hmm. to call it a health tech company probably actually gives the entrepreneur short shrift. It probably doesn't give the entrepreneur enough credit because what they're really doing is just the nuts and bolts of healthcare better than what's available in the market. And technology just happens to be uh, a part of the solution. So in terms of disruptive technologies, we, we, we try not to think about that, media capital partners. I think what we try to think about in a, in, in a much more simple way is what's the consumer experience today? And what could the consumer experience be? And often, the, the delta there is a technology enabled solution. It is technology. Um, but once we start thinking about disruptive technologies as, uh, as the end as opposed to the means, uh, I, I think we, you know, we, uh, we get a little bit into fallacious thinking. Yes, um, so you, um, you, you are familiar with the Indonesian market as well. Uh, well, 
I, I talk to a lot of people and, and, and they say that uh, it's really hard to compare between the two markets, but I'm the kind of a person who likes to compare. So I'm curious to know um, that from your experience and uh, um, at which stage is Vietnam um, at right now that uh, Indonesia also reflected that, um, um, like that past in the past? Well, I, I, I'm very careful to cast myself as any sort of Indonesia expert. Uh, but that being said, what I, what I would point out is I think that Indonesia and Vietnam are actually very different. Uh, you know, one is culturally, uh, religiously, politically much more heterogeneous uh, than the other. Uh, one, you know, one country's legal and regulatory system uh, is much more akin to what you might see in China uh, as opposed to the other. Uh, and I think the, the, the path of development for the two countries is, is, is very different. Um, and as a result, the type of entrepreneur and the, the competitive threats and opportunities that an entrepreneur in, in each country faces is, is quite different. So what I'd probably say is, is not to punt the question, but I, what I'd probably say is that the, the types of risks that we underwrite and the returns that we underwrite in Vietnam, uh, we, we look at it in a completely different way from how we would look at it in, in Indonesia. And just one example of that would be from our, from our limited experience in Indonesia, your prototypical entrepreneur needs to be very concerned with what a number of industrialist family run companies are doing. Uh, that may be the case in Vietnam in certain sectors, but it's not the case in most sectors. And as a result of that, the type of entrepreneur that we would engage with in Vietnam uh, has a very different skill set in many respects from an entrepreneur in, in a similar sector in Indonesia. So I would, I would actually hesitate or I'd be reluctant to, uh, to compare those two economies from a private equity standpoint uh, too much. Yes, um, just to stop you there, um, to inform the attendees that we have 10 minutes uh, left for this panel. So if you have any questions to, um, to our experts, to our panelists here, so uh, please do send your question in the uh, comment box or the uh, a Q and A box that you see um, at the side um, of the Axel event platform. Um, so, um, a question for V. Um, so, um, so you you have been talking a lot about the the hope and the uh, aspire to have more unicorns coming out of Vietnam. Um, so, uh, so in addition to you know having more unicorns, um, what kind of success stories that? Um, you would expect to see uh, coming out uh, of the country? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I think, you know, the term unicorn is just meant to, uh, you know, uh, put a milestone on the company, right? So let's say if you reach a 1 billion uh, valuation, it means that uh, your business model is somehow validated up to that point. But it's not the end, right? It's a, it's a part of the journey. And I think for Vietnam to really uh, grow the technical system, we definitely need more success use cases. For example, you know, before, I think it's just BNG. Now we see more companies that are passing the 100 million milestone and a few companies, you know, almost uh, reaching 1 billion uh, in, 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 in just a few years. So I think that's very inspirational to, to many young founders. And um, to be honest, right, when you look at Vietnam market, although we have 100 million population, our GDP per capita is still very low. So, you know, just roughly estimate, right? If you want your company to be evaluated at uh, like 1 billion, you have to reach like a few hundred million in terms of revenue, or, you know, your company needs to you know, be profitable uh, somehow. Um, so I think in Vietnam, um, I'm very hopeful because I look at uh, a number of sectors. I think right now Vietnam is still in the very early stage, but we have high growth in sector like e-commerce. And after COVID, I strongly believe that uh, the new wave of e-commerce would be social commerce. So I've seen a number of companies trying to leverage, uh, you know, the current infrastructure of e-commerce. You know, like for example, uh, delivery time. So in Vietnam now, we can actually ship a product much faster than in the U.S. 
we can you know receive a product in like 30 minutes or to to you know like few hours thanks to s commerce <laughs> our move service right so i think the the service level has tremendously improved and if uh, you know the young company can re-leverage uh, new technology or leverage the social aspect of of uh, you know of uh, uh, you know, everyone interaction right now like leveraging the traffic from from uh, youtube facebook tiktok we can definitely create a sustainable and profitable business and at the same time grow your business to more than you know a few hundred million in depth. So I strongly believe that um, you know definitely Vietnam we see more unicorns coming out. Uh, you know, just to reemphasize my point, the unicorn is not an end, right? It's just a validation. It's a milestone that only startups will, will, will have and it will create a lot of uh, inspiration for young founders to strive for. Yes, we have we have an uh, aspiring unicorn here as comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, when did you expect to gain that title, and um, and, and what's your bet uh, on technology in general? I think our target is to work hard and to win more customers over time, and <laughs> it's the investors that decide the valuation. But I think at, at the end of the day, obviously, we want everyone to make good money and come back and invest in more companies in Vietnam. Uh, just to, to echo B's point, I think it's just a matter of time. Because if you look at like GDP, economic growth, et cetera, and compare Vietnam with Indonesia or Thailand, uh, our GDP per person is about 20% less than, than Indonesia and about half of that of Thailand. So, and, and then if you look at the number of management talents that have exposure to you know, global companies or professional services before, or if you look at you know the number of serial uh, serial entrepreneurs uh, etc uh, all those numbers are catching up but obviously in sheer volume then it's, you know not as high as in indonesia or especially in china india yet uh, but you know despite that sort of lack of depth and and breadth in terms of the ecosystem uh, it is growing fast as uh, we said and i think it's just a matter of time that we see more low companies uh, coming out and growing big if you look deeper into uh, some sectors in Vietnam, like you know logistics, like ourselves, uh, you look at retail, online offline retail, like Mobile World. If you look at you know very operational heavy business, we do see you know very very big companies that are doing very well and really fed off the regional competitors that come into Vietnam. So overall, you know we are a very optimistic uh, country. Uh, we are super entrepreneurial and we have millions of SMEs and mom and pop stores that really mobilize the economy. Uh, whether we have more unicorns or less unicorns in Indonesia, I don't think it really is a competition because at the end of the day, right, it's the growth of the economy and the prosperity of its people that matter. Yeah. Well, I have, I have to point to add to uh, the Han story. So I have a very funny story. So I first met the CEO of S-Commerce, Mr. Hoi, uh, in 2011. And I was one of his first customers when he first uh, started uh, GSM. And uh, to my surprise, right, he managed to grow the company to this level. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, the e-commerce market size was, you know, a few hundred million US dollars back in uh, 2010. Uh, and just, uh, just uh, I think this year, right, the e-commerce market expected to be about 7 billion, right, according to Google Financial Report. And uh, until 2025, it's going to grow like 5 to 7 X. Right. So I'm going to say I, I would bet on GSM and S commerce to grow past the one billion milestone, right? Because if the market will grow five to seven X. Right? Honest, honestly, you will grow at least, you know, on par with the market or even more. So yes. we have high hope for, for GSM and S commerce growth. Yes. Um, so uh, we have a uh, quest uh, question from the audience. Uh, are all industry companies crowding out opportunities for younger people, younger companies, uh, for example, in payment space, or would it be hard for young fintechs or foreign companies fight with uh, WeNPay uh, or GrabPay by Mocha? So, um, V, can you take these questions and make it a one minute answer? I think for fintech, it's a, it's a crowded space, right? Depending on the sector that you want to enter. If you want to enter payment or lending, uh, you will you have to face up incumbents and uh, those are quite established uh, companies right unless you have a very you know distinct thesis you find a niche that you can enter and you know use capital more efficiently then i think you should look into a fintech and labor space for example right because all the company they would want to become a fintech super app they want to provide everything so lending is just one use case 
and they can do like web management, they can do you know insurance, they can do um, uh, lending. So I think I think there's a lot of opportunities to provide tools to allow these companies to grow faster. And as the industry grow, you can grow with them. So rather than like competition, direct competition with these giants, you can find a way to partner with them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's the wrap for this closing panel. So I hope that all attendees and all other speakers uh, have a fruitful uh, event with us uh, throughout the past two days. So thank you, V. Thank you, Hang, and thank you, Bert, uh, for joining us. Uh, so let's hope we uh, win, have time to catch up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.